Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, and it's great to be with you again. Uh, we are sponsored today by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technology. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, we spend a lot of time in the pages of naval history covering the largest naval war ever fought, a.k.a. World War II. And a lot of naval historical firsts emerge from that period of history in that chapter. But interestingly enough, the prelude war in Europe in the years before World War II, the war that, that uh, racked Spain from 1936 to 1939, the bitterly fought Spanish Civil War between the nationalists on one side and the Republicans on the other, was quite a prelude to the larger conflagration that would grip the world a mere few years later. And many naval historical firsts actually occur during the Spanish Civil War. The naval aspects of that war have been largely overlooked in English historical accounts of that war. That's changed now. And joining us today to discuss his fascinating article and new issue of the magazine is Leonard Hines, who's going to talk about the role of sea power in the Spanish Civil War. Len, welcome aboard. Good to see you. Eric, uh, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Well, um, this is a very, very interesting story, and it's it's sort of a good preview for um, a book you have coming out next spring that um, will cover the naval aspects of the Spanish Civil War. This would be of great interest to our readers, obviously. And they get a nice foretasting of it in this issue of the magazine with your article. So let's talk about some of these things that um, were first seen in the world of naval history in the Spanish Civil War. Maybe set the table with a little bit about the, uh, the cause of that war itself and who's on which side and all that sort of thing. Sure, uh, you, you, you've done a good job uh, in your intro, uh, but Eric, as you said, this was a war fought between the nationalists and the Republicans uh, in, the Sp in Spain. The, the Republicans uh, also, could also be referred to as the government, uh, or in some cases, the Popular Front. There were many different names, but they were essentially the government in Spain that was in power uh, in July, 1936. A, a government uh, dominated uh, by uh, the parties of the left, uh, socialists, uh, anarchists, and even the small communist party that existed in Spain. Uh, opposing them were the nationalists. Uh, they didn't start out as the nationalists. They started out as a conspiracy of army officers uh, that aimed to overthrow uh, the government, uh, something that was a bit of an historical tradition in Spain. Uh, the army often stepped in uh, and ousted the government if it didn't like the, uh, uh, the direction the government was taking. In this case, though, uh, there was not a, a coup that resulted in uh, immediate success for the army. Uh, instead, uh, what resulted was a civil war that, that lasted from July 1936 uh, all the way through uh, March of 1939. That war had significant naval aspects. And while uh, those aspects are pretty well covered in Spanish language histories of the war, they're, uh, they're much less well covered in uh, English histories. Uh, in fact, I was uh, working up a presentation uh, a little bit ago on, the, on this, and my first slide said maritime aspects of the Spanish Civil War. My next slide said, were there any? <laughs> uh, and the answer is yes, <laughs> there, were, there were many. Uh, the fundamental key to understanding that is that, that both sides in the struggle, both the nationalists and, re and the Republicans, relied upon foreign military aid uh, to conduct their war. Uh, without it, uh, they would have been in serious difficulties. In the case of the Republic, most of that aid came from Soviet Russia. And while the uh, while Republican Spain shared a border with France, uh, 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 the French political winds were constantly changing, and the Republicans simply could not count on aid flowing from Russia to France and then across the border. The result was that much of the aid came from uh, uh, Soviet ports in the Black Sea, 
uh, to Spanish Mediterranean ports uh, controlled by the Republic. The, uh, it, with some coming from Romansk to the northern coast of Spain, a portion of which was also controlled by the Republic. Well, just as badly as the Republic wanted to get that aid, the nationalists wanted to, uh, to stop that aid from coming. Uh, the Republic started the war with uh, a larger navy uh, than the nationalists had. In fact, uh, the nationalists uh, at the start of the war were only in control of a couple of small gunboats, uh, an older destroyer, and uh, a battleship uh, that was essentially decommissioned uh, and waiting scrapping. Fortunately for the nationalists, though, uh, they had control of El Farol, the, uh, the major Spanish naval base, uh, where there were two heavy cruisers completing and a number of mine layers as well. So uh, the, the nationalists raced to get those ships into commission and then uh, from there race to institute a blockade of the Republican uh, ports with considerable, uh, well, with mixed fortunes. Uh, uh, they, they had some successes and they had a number of failures as well. On the nationalist side, aid came from uh, Italy and from Germany. Uh, the, there, were, there was no way for that aid to move overland. Uh, so uh, it flowed from German ports and from Italian ports uh, to Spain itself. Uh, the Republic made some attempts early on to interfere with that trade, uh, but were, were run off pretty quickly uh, by vociferous uh, protests from both uh, the Germans and from the Italians. Uh, the net result of all this was that, that not only was there an act of maritime war uh, between the the nationalist navy and the Republican navy, uh, but there was there were considerable activities from uh, the uh, the British navy uh, protecting British trade, uh, particularly to the northern Spanish coast, uh, from the French navy, which also wanted to protect its trade, uh, and occasionally. Uh, when the political winds permitted it support the Republic. Uh, the, the German Navy, uh, which wanted to safeguard its ships and, and did that mostly by, by subterfuge, use of false flags, but was always, always ready to employ force uh, if they felt the force was necessary. And then finally, the Italian Navy, which took an even more active role uh, than the German Navy uh, in both protecting its ships carrying supplies to, uh, to nationalist Spain and uh, operating uh, quite directly, although uh, clandestinely, uh, against uh, Republican naval forces. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, it's so interesting to see how the, um, the nations supporting the two rival factions create a sort of quasi- um, proxy war, if you will, that's a, pre a preview of the greater war to follow. Um, you've got the what will soon be the Axis powers uh, of World War II supporting um, the, the nationalists uh, led by Franco. Uh, the Ger Nazi Germany supplied quite a bit of air power and troops and naval assets to the nationalists in the Spanish Civil War, which is interesting. And um, and the article, we run a photo of uh, Franco and Hitler meeting shortly after the war, um, where when Hitler's trying to bring Spain into the Axis fold, which almost could have happened. Um, we won't get into why it didn't here, but uh, I find that very fascinating. And then you've got the Royal Navy on the other side. So I guess none of the sides realized it at the time, but, but this is all very much a, 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 a prelude for what's going to happen soon. Um, and the political ideologies of this civil war, the ideologies of the nations supporting one side or the other line up with that, do they not? Now, I, I understand that the Republican in this war did not have a lot of over, official overseas um, endorsement of their side or alliances, but there's a lot of people from all over the world were sending, tr you know, volunteer troops were going to fight on their side. Um, you've got German troops, but the main thing we want to talk about here, of course, is the naval aspect. So let's talk about some of the uh, maiden runs, if you if you will, of uh, Germans, um, Krieg, Germany's Kriegsmarine and trial runs of things that were sort of beta tested, if you will, in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, one thing we should start with is uh, a German ship 
famous from World War II, from earlier World War II, the Admiral Graf Spee. Um, she has a role in the Spanish Civil War, correct? Yes, she does. Uh, uh, Graf Spee and, and her sister ships uh, uh, were often posted to uh, the Mediterranean uh, by, uh, by the Kriegsmarine to, to first to, to safeguard uh, uh, German interests there, uh, secondly, to intimidate the, uh, the Republican Navy uh, and uh, keep it from seizing German supply ships uh, that were uh, coming into ports like uh, Cadiz uh, 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 and Seville. And, and then third, that they play at, at times an even more active role uh, in uh, tracking uh, Republican uh, surface forces uh, and uh, broadcasting their whereabouts so the nationalists would know where they were. Uh, in some cases, uh, even providing uh, early in the war, uh, uh, air reconnaissance uh, assets uh, that that searched for Republican ships on behalf of the nationalists, uh, and then you know as you as you point out, Eric, the uh, the role that the Germans played became uh, more and more prominent as as the war went on. Uh, I think you know many of the listeners here have heard of the Condor Legion. Uh, which was the, the German unit uh, that did a lot of beta testing uh, of uh, German equipment, but also you know, trained nationalist troops in, in the use of that equipment as it was supplied in, uh, in fairly large quantities to the nationalists. Um, the Kriegsmarine was not as, um, uh, as eager as, uh, as the German army was to take a, a very active role uh, in the uh, uh, in the Spanish Civil War, but when they when they saw uh, German uh, interest being threatened, uh, they uh, they were quite willing to step right up. Which I guess brings us to the story of the Graf Spee uh, and uh, her involvement in the war. Th this stems from uh, an early attempt on the part of the Republican government to interfere with uh, some of the supplies that the. Germans were uh, were sending uh, to to the nationalists, and you now interestingly, as I said, the Republicans uh, well intimidation worked with the Republicans, and they fairly rapidly backed off attempts to seize German and Italian ships. Uh, but one of the allies to the Republicans uh, in the war were uh, were the Basques, uh, situated in the northern part of Spain, and you know, kind of stereotypically, you, know, you think of the Basques as you know, they're either shepherds or ship owners. Uh, and many of them uh, were ship owners. Uh, uh, the Basques had a significant merchant fleet uh, under their control, uh, a shipping fleet which provided auxiliaries uh, that, the, that the Republicans armed uh, and permitted uh, the Basques to have their own uh, coastal navy uh, up north. Uh, the Basques used that to seize a, a German uh, merchant ship uh, named Pallas uh, fairly early in the war. Uh, in uh, in December of 1936, uh, and this sparked a, a furious German reaction, uh, not just uh, a war of words, but uh, even after the Basques released the ship, although retaining some of its cargo, the Germans decided that wasn't good enough and, uh, and started seizing uh, Spanish merchant ships. Um, now, you know, Graf Spee, of course, is famous uh, for its uh, its cruise early in World War One, where it seized, I think, a total of nine British merchant ships before it was eventually tracked down and uh, and you know defeated uh, off Montevideo Harbor uh, in the Battle of the River Plate. But her her first capture of her merchant ship actually takes place in uh, January of 1937, uh, pursuant to orders from the Kriegsmarine to keep capturing Spanish merchant ships, Republican merchant ships, until uh, uh, German armor is satisfied. So she takes one, uh, the light cruiser Konigsberg takes another, uh, and at that point the Germans decide that uh, they've, they've communicated uh, the message they want to communicate uh, and, uh, and uh, stop, uh, stop their anti-shipping campaign. Um, another a sister ship of Graf Spee's, um, the, uh, the Deutschland, later the Lutzau, is that right? Uh, yes, they renamed right. it. In World, yeah, they renamed it in World War II because they didn't want to give the potential propaganda val value of um, the Allies sinking a ship called Germany. It's like sinking yeah. Germany. So, but Lutzow, uh, formerly known as the Deutschland, had a very uh, 
problematic career during World War II. Um, she was just snake bit from the get-go in that war. One thing after another seemed to befall her. But uh, she had her first kind of rocky start and all that during the Spanish Civil War, correct? That, that is true. Uh, and, and this takes us to the summer of 1937. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, the, the major European navies are all engaged in um, uh, what are called non-intervention patrols. And the idea here is that uh, uh, they will uh, keep foreign aid from, uh, foreign military aid from reaching either the nationalists or the Republicans by patrolling off ports and uh, stopping, uh, well, not Spanish flag merchant ships, but other flag merchant ships from bringing more supplies in. These patrols are a farce. Uh, uh, the Germans uh, and Italians treat them as a farce. Uh, they they run uh, rings around the patrols. The ships patrolling have no real power of, of authority to stop a, uh, a merchant ship from entering the Spanish port. Uh, but nonetheless, it gives the the Germans and the Italians uh, the ability to hover off Republican ports and uh, keep a close eye on what's going on. Uh, the, uh, the the German, well, actually all the navies uh, used uh, the, the harbor of Palma in the island of Mallorca as a base from which to conduct these patrols in the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, it was there that uh, the uh, nationalists also uh, maintained uh, a base because if you look at a map, you can see that Mallorca is quite handy uh, to uh, anti-trade operations if you, against the, uh, the Mediterranean coasts of Spain, which were largely controlled by the Republicans at this time. The Republicans decided to do something about that. Uh, and, and here the Republican Air Force uh, plays a role. Uh, the Republican Navy pretty quickly lost control of its Air Force at the start of the war. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the independent Air Force that resulted uh, wanted little to do with the maritime aspects of the war. Uh, but that changed uh, in summer of 1937 when uh, the Republican uh, Air Force uh, used a tuple of SB bombers to mount a raid on, uh, on Mallorca. In fact, they, they mounted a few different raids uh, and ultimately convinced the Germans that maybe they should look for a safer harbor somewhere else. Uh, so uh, Deutschland, which was uh, conducting uh, these uh, uh, neutrality or non-intervention patrols at the time, moved, moved to Ibiza. Uh, you know, this, this reminds me of the old joke uh, about the, the man who, who dreams that death is going to come for him in Minsk. And so he gets on the train, goes to Pinsk, uh, gets off and meets death, who says, oh, I expected to see you in Minsk, uh, because what happened was uh, the, uh, the Republicans decided that maybe the Nationalists were going to move their ships uh, to the harbor at Ibiza, and so they mounted a, uh, a, a bombing, actually a combined bombing raid and bombardment by a couple of destroyers on that port. Uh, well, they didn't find the Nationalists. Uh, they did find uh, the Deutschland, uh, but like uh, most uh, air crews of the time uh, that you know, received no maritime training, they couldn't tell one ship for the other. Uh, and so uh, they bombed Deutschland, uh, even uh, while the, the German crews were essentially oblivious to the fact that they were under attack. Uh, the attack took, uh, took a heavy toll. Uh, I think uh, close to 100 uh, German sailors were, uh, um, were either uh, uh, killed or wounded. Uh, in uh, as a result of two bombs uh, that struck the ship. Um, the Germans, of course, were furious, uh, as you would expect. And uh, this time, uh, they, uh, they decided that they were going to bombard uh, the, the harbor of uh, Almiera, which they did, uh, resulting in close to 100 casualties. So really, that, that incident or chain of incidents uh, is two firsts. Uh, it's uh, the first Craigsman ship uh, that gets bombed. Uh, well, you know, well before the start of World War II, and it's also the first time that uh, that Kriegsmarine guns speak in anger. Uh, again, uh, well before the start of the war. Very fascinating. Um, some other assets of the, the Kriegsmarine get to go out and do their sort of trial runs in uh, the Spanish Civil War. Let's talk about, I believe it's Operation Ursula. Ursula. Called. Yeah, uh, Ursula, named after uh, Karl Donitz's daughter, uh, apparently. Uh, was uh, 
a, uh, uh, a German operation in which uh, they sent two subs, U-33 and U-34, uh, from Wilhelmshaven all the way down into the Met. Um, now, at the time, the Italians were conducting an active anti-submarine or active submarine campaign uh, against uh, the Republicans. In fact, an Italian submarine had had torpedoed uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Republican cruiser uh, Cervantes uh, in um, uh, in November uh, when this operation began. Uh, the uh, the idea is very much to do a trial run. Uh, the the submarine arm of the Craig's Marine was uh, pretty much brand spanking new. I mean, they had kept in touch with um, uh, submarine developments uh, in the interwar years, clandestinely, and then a bit more openly after 1935. Uh, and you know, they 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 used even you know World War One designs as a basis for some of their uh, their their new submarines. But this was all untested, uh, as were uh, the commanders and the crews. So they thought this would be a good a good test. It turned out to be a very frustrating one. Uh, once the Italians had attacked uh, the Republican ships, uh, they they made themselves scarce, uh, at least until they could put uh, anti-submarine measures in place. And here I should note the the uh, the Nationalists had no submarines, so it was a great shock to Republicans uh, to find torpedoes streaking towards their ships. Uh, but but the result of that was. Uh, the, uh, the the Germans were told to restrict their attacks to uh, uh, to warships. The only warships that were about at that point were uh, Republican destroyers, who were and they were pretty wary uh, at the time. Uh, the, the Germans had no success and eventually turned around and headed for home. Uh, and they were doing that in early December when uh, when uh, the captain of one of the subs uh, saw the Spanish Republican submarine uh, uh, C three. Uh, cruising on the surface, decided to launch one last torpedo uh, in the hopes that uh, maybe success that had eluded him so far would uh, would uh, finally meet him. Uh, and in this, he was successful. Uh, his single torpedo hit and sank U-3. Only three of her crew survived. Uh, uh, and so uh, the, the German submarine arm was able to rack up its first success, uh, again, well before the start of World War II. Now, I, I will note, and it's interesting to note, that uh, the, the torpedo that hit U-3 either didn't detonate at all or detonated and, and managed to punch a hole in the pressure hull regardless, or detonated with a fairly, relatively low order uh, of detonation, uh, indicating that there might be some problems uh, with German torpedoes. Uh, but uh, those problems really weren't recognized or corrected uh, until uh, well after World War II had begun. So that was um, a forewarning for the U-boat force that they had a problem with the torpedoes. And those this problems would carry on into the following war. It was like a lesson unheeded at the time, um, like a lot of these were. Uh, well, the U-boats get their little uh, pre-World War II workout in, this, in the Spanish Civil War. And uh, the much vaunted British anti-submarine warfare technology does as well. Let's talk about ASDIC's uh, sort of rough start. Okay, uh, ASDIC uh, was supposed to be a, a, a miracle device. Uh, uh, ASDIC, which uh, you know, American re readers and listeners will know as sonar, uh, was in development during World War I, uh, but actually only saw its first tests uh, at, the, at the close of the war. And it was then uh, developed uh, in the interwar years uh, pretty continuously. And as it was developed, uh, a fair number of officers in the British Navy felt that, that, that this was really the answer uh, to uh, the submarine menace uh, that had been so dire in World War One. that with, uh, with Aztec uh, operating at peak performance, uh, any submarine was going to be spotted, easily tracked, uh, uh, attacked, uh, and destroyed. Um, in fact, uh, not only did they, they, they feel that you know, that would be the case, but they also undertook a, a little bit of a, a propaganda offensive uh, in the interwar years to uh, to let other navies know that, without sharing a lot of details, you know, they had this miracle device that would neutralize submarines, and uh, maybe it wouldn't be very worthwhile for other navies to spend uh, a lot of time and treasure uh, building up their own submarine forces. Uh, well, that's how matters stood uh, until uh, September of uh, 1937. 
at, at that time, the Italians had mounted a major effort uh, to try to interdict uh, Soviet supplies uh, that were supposedly coming from the Black Sea. Uh, there, there were rumors afoot uh, that the Russians were sending a tremendous convoy with you know, an army corps, and thousands of tanks and hundreds of uh, that were going to, to just decisively tip the balance uh, against uh, the nationalist forces. And, and so in, in response to nationalist pleas, uh, 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 Mussolini, uh, who was always uh, more avid in supporting uh, the, uh, the nationalists than, uh, than the Regia Marina was, uh, uh, instructed the, the Italian Navy to conduct a, an extensive, an extensive uh, submarine campaign, anti-trade campaign that stretched from uh, from the Dardanelles uh, all the way uh, to uh, the, the Spanish Mediterranean uh, ports themselves. And the idea was uh, to only attack uh, Spanish warships or uh, ships flying, uh, merchant ships flying the Spanish or Soviet flag. But th that, that kind of instruction is always naive. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, overeager uh, Italian submarine commanders began to attack uh, uh, merchant ships flying other flags, and even occasionally uh, warships. Uh, they, they did attack uh, successfully uh, a Spanish warship, torpedoed or didn't sink her. Uh, but uh, uh, in uh, early September, uh, Iride uh, was cruising in the Balearic Sea and uh, thought for sure that she saw uh, another uh, Spanish uh, destroyer that was uh, right for the pickings. Uh, well, uh, the destroyer was not Spanish. Uh, it was the British destroyer Havoc. Uh, uh, Iridi attacked with uh, two torpedoes. Uh, Havoc avoided them both. Uh, her commander could have made an immediate attack because the, uh, the Italian submarine uh, broached uh, after firing her torpedoes, but, but he did not. Uh, instead, he decided, well, you know, let's, let's try this miracle device, Aztec. Uh, let's uh, let's fully arm uh, our depth charges so that we can, you know, we can launch a full spread and let's hunt her down. Well, that didn't go very well. Uh, uh, they were unable to uh, to make contact. Uh, uh, Havoc was uh, augmented by uh, uh, by other uh, ships of her class. Uh, I think three or four others eventually showed up. Um, uh, none of which were able to convincingly. Uh, gain a contact or, or make a successful attack. Eventually, the Admiralty itself called the whole thing off because they said, you know, by, by this time, you know, more than a day had gone by, more than 12 hours had gone by. And they said, look, even if you're getting contacts, there's no way of knowing whether that's that's the submarine that attacked you. Uh, so uh, this this was an unpromising start uh, to um, uh, to Aztec. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's another story that follows from this one because uh, although... Uh, the uh, the attacks uh, were by the British destroyers were not successful. Uh, the British continued to mount their propaganda campaign. Uh, the uh, the British admiral in, in charge, Admiral Somerville at that time, uh, went to see his opposite number uh, in uh, in Mallorca, and and said, you know, we we could have sunk you at any time, uh, but uh, we didn't have orders to do that, and we simply wanted to uh, to harass you. Uh, the, uh, uh, a few days later, the, uh, uh, the commander of the British destroyer squadron shows up and says, uh, yes, uh, you know, we, well, you know, we had you, you know, we had you in our sights all the time. You know, we were easily able to track you. Uh, the Spanish admiral says, well, but, but, you know, you were, you were moving at 20 knots and, and your, your, your formation was such that your ships were close together. How could hydrophones, uh, possibly have worked in a situation like that? You can't be serious. And, uh, and uh, uh, Commander Boyd says, "Well, uh, no, it's not hydrophones. Uh, it is, in fact, you know, our, you know, a, a totally different weapon, a totally different device that we're using to be able to track you." And uh, the the Spanish admiral apparently uh, bought that. You know, he, he sent a signal back uh, to uh, uh, Region Marine headquarters, said, "You know, we should we should really pay more attention to this because it seems to be something we should be concerned about." Although, in fact, uh, Aztec in its uh, in its first combat use. Uh, did not uh, uh, did not meet expectations. How did it do in World War II? Just to follow up on this. Uh, well, it it it, uh, it did better in World War II. Um, uh, I think you know a combination of 
understanding its limitations, uh, refining the techniques for its use. Uh, the Germans, however, were able, however, were able to uh, defeat it uh, for quite some time uh, by, uh, by operating on the surface. Uh, sonar uh, will not detect a surface submarine, uh, and it was uh, surface attacks and bad visibility into night uh, that took such a toll on uh, Allied shipping, uh, particularly in the in the first years of World War II. All these things that um, sort of come to their fruition in World War II, you can see the inklings of them here. Put a capper on how this whole thing turned out. The yep. Nationalists obviously won. Franco would remain in power until 1975. Boggles yep. the mind to think about that. Uh, I mentioned back earlier in the start um, how uh, Hitler courted Franco to bring Spain into the Axis. Yet that didn't work out. This was in 1940. Uh, Franco's demands were such that uh, Hitler kind of backed off, like trying to get him in there. Ideologically, the uh, the emergent military power that is Nazi Germany sees what's going on in Spain as something they align with. What I'm asking you a, a sort of a, a counterfactual here. What if Spain had joined the Axis in 1940? How would that have impacted the map of the European theater of World War II? Um, well, as with all counterfactuals, uh, it's uh, it's a bit hard to say. Uh, of course, it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, but um, uh, you know, I think you'd have to assume that if Spain uh, joined the Axis, uh, I mean, let's assume they they Spain joined shortly after the outset of the war. Um, you know, there's always a possibility uh, that the French could decide to lance that boil. Uh, but I think that's unlikely. The French were completely occupied uh, with uh, the Germans and probably could not have spared the forces uh, to do that. Um, Spanish uh, ports uh, would have then uh, potentially been open to uh, German U-boats, for example, or German merchant raiders. Uh, but Spain would have uh, faced a very rigorous blockade uh, from uh, the British and the French navies. Uh, uh, both of whom uh, contemplated the fact that you know, they could wind up with a hostile Spain. But uh, in, in 1939 and 1940, Spain was very dependent uh, upon foreign trade. The country was, was shattered, impoverished. Uh, I don't think it could even feed itself. Uh, so Spain, Spain would have faced some rigors there. Of course, uh, you know, you, uh, Eric, uh, you know, you're alluding to conversation uh, in which uh, after the fall of France, Hitler goes to Franco and says, look, uh, you know, let us move troops through your country uh, so we can take Gibraltar, uh, which would have been a, you know, a grievous blow to the British uh, if, uh, if that were to take place. Uh, Franco, of course, turns him down. I mean, afterwards, Hitler famously says, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather go to the dentist <laughs> than, than spend another hour uh, talking to Franco. Uh, <laughs> And, and and that really, uh, I mean that that speaks to uh, to uh, Franco's uh, worldview. I mean, Fr Franco Franco put the national in nationalists. Uh, he was all about Spain, Spain, and only Spain. Uh, Mussolini uh, hoped about that by getting involved in the Spanish Civil War, uh, he would perhaps get basing rights uh, in uh, Majorca, for example which would allow him to uh, you know, step on France's windpipe uh, if uh, the French were trying to bring troops or supplies from French North Africa to, uh, uh, to metropolitan France. And um, uh, you know, Franco just, just turned him down cold. I mean, there was no way that Franco was going to let uh, any foreign power, even one that had aided him as much as, uh, as Italy did, and Italy probably, well, Italy almost certainly provided more aid than Germany did uh, to, to Franco in the, in the war. And, and likewise, uh, you know, the Germans did not have the same territorial aspirations early on, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they had to fight Franco tooth and nail uh, to get any recompense uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the supplies that, that they provided to him during the war. So, you know, it's interesting to contemplate what if uh, Spain were Axis instead of neutral. Uh, but I think uh, between Franco's attitude and just the, uh, uh, the, the sheer toll that the Civil War had taken on Spain, 
uh, it would have been very unlikely uh, for uh, the Spanish to ever uh, have you know, any desire to join the Axis powers, at least not, I mean, not, not unless it was a situation where, you know, Hitler had otherwise, uh, uh, you know, you know, overrun all of Europe, defeated, uh, defeated Great Britain, and and now there was little to lose by joining. So, fortunately for history, um, Franco was willing to accept um, Germany's and Italy's aid when he needed it, but he was um, intent on avoiding any entangling alliances afterwards. Exactly. Uh, it is it, it is horrifying to think if he'd allowed uh, German access to march through to take Gibraltar from the land side, how that would have impacted the war in the Mediterranean theater. But like you say, all these what ifs lead to uh, endless worlds of maybe. So, yeah. but they're fun to think about. Yeah, they are. I mean, it is. It's fun to think about whether the Germans could have taken Gibraltar. Uh, right. That would have been. Uh, that opens up a whole new protracted yeah. campaign, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, it, it, it's not. It's not a gimme. It's not like Gibraltar would have, you know, fallen to the Germans like ripe fruit. Uh, yeah. You know, that was a. You know, that was a, that would have been a tough. You know, fortified uh, base to uh, to have a tough nut to crack. That's why Gibraltar is the meta metaphor for the any place that's unassailable. Exactly. You know? exactly. <laughs> it means that for a reason. Yep. Uh, fascinating. So, if when you're interested in this period of uh, you know global history and uh, the naval aspects of global history, this is so overshadowed by the Titanic World War II that follows. But it, it really is an interesting sort of uh, prologue to it all in so many ways. And um, I look forward to seeing your book in full. Your uh, article has seriously whetted my appetite. It's called The Fleet That Fought Itself, correct? Yeah, the book, the book, right? is, the, yes, the book is The Fleet That Fought Itself. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it, it focuses on the operational aspects of the war. Uh, the, uh, the political aspects of the war, including the political aspects of the naval war, uh, have been pretty well covered. And uh, there, there are a couple of books out there that also deal with uh, the merchant marine, and particularly uh, the, the neutral flag merchant ships uh, that were carrying or smuggling uh, goods, uh, goods into Spain. But, but this is a look at uh, the, you know, the, the two Spanish navies and you know what their you know what their goals were, how they operated, you know their successes, their failures, uh, some some reasons why, and then of course also the the foreign navies that were involved as well, because you can't look at what the Spanish navies were doing in isolation. Uh, you have to look at that in the context of uh, both the aid and the restraint uh, uh, that came from uh, from the foreign navies that were very much a part of the picture. Uh, the book's coming out uh, the end of March. Uh, I think it's available for pre-order now on the UK Amazon site because it's being published by Seaforth, uh, a division of Pen and Sword, uh, of course, a uh, you know a British publisher. So yeah, I'm 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 excited about that. Uh, I mean, it's uh, uh, you know someone once said to me, if you want to learn about something, write a book, uh, and I was really interested in learning about this aspect uh, of uh, you know the the war before the war, uh, and writing a book proved to be an excellent way to, uh, to to take a deep dive into it and learn more about it. It's always great when you find a, a stone you haven't turned over yet and find all the history that's under there that ties in with the larger picture you've been looking at before. And this is very much that. I recommend this article uh, to all our readers if you haven't seen it yet. It's in the exciting new issue of the magazine, chock full of good content. This was just a taste of one of the articles that's in there, and we'll have more to follow. And we'll have more to follow from Leonard Hines as well um, as time goes forward. Uh, it's always great to have you in the magazine, Len, and uh, this is a really uh, groundbreaking piece of work you've done here. So more power to you, and it's great to see you and talk with you, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, and it's, it's always great to, to be in the magazine. I mean, it is, you know, I, I view it as, as an honor and really a thrill uh, to to see myself published in a, uh, in a magazine like Naval History, which you know, really I think leads the way uh, in, in terms of uh, you know current examination of uh, of naval history topics. It's a, it's a, a terrific magazine, a terrific resource. Well, bless you for that. That's always great to hear. We'll end on that up note. Thanks again, Len. Okay. Take care. It was good to see you. You as well. 
Well, that's it for us for today, folks. Um, but we'll be back again with you very soon for more interesting content from the current issue of Naval History Magazine. Until then, farewell.